Hello, my name is Steve Terrett and I'm the director of the British Law Centre. And I'd like to welcome you to a very special edition of the BLC Box podcast today. It's a special edition because I'm delighted to be joined by Lord Lloyd-Jones, one of the justices of the UK's Supreme Court, or one of the law lords as they are more traditionally known. Lord Lloyd-Jones had an incredible career and is still enjoying an incredible career. He was an academic at Cambridge University and also practiced as a barrister. He was later appointed a Queen's Counsel in 1999 before he joined the bench and became a judge, first of the High Court and then of the Court of Appeal before he was appointed as a Justice of the Supreme Court. And whether he was working as a barrister or sitting as a judge, he has enjoyed a very well-deserved reputation as someone who is capable of handling an immense volume of materials and very complicated matters and being on top completely of every aspect of a case. And they are precisely the skills that make other lawyers feel very nervous. I would be very, very nervous today. This is the first time that I have interviewed a law lord and it will probably be the last time in my life too. So I would be petrified with nerves if not for the fact that I have already had the pleasure of meeting Lord Lloyd-Jones. So I can say with absolute confidence that aside from his illustrious legal career, he's an exceptionally kind and friendly man. And that knowledge alone has made me feel a lot less nervous than I otherwise would do. Lord Lloyd-Jones had very kindly agreed to visit the British Law Centre in Prague this year and to give a lecture there. But unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic halted the travel plans that we had and it delayed the lecture until this time next year. But before then, I'm, I'm delighted that he's been able to find time in his incredibly busy, busy schedule to join us for this podcast today. So Lord Lloyd-Jones, sincerely, hello, welcome. It's great, great to have you here. Thank you, Steve. It's a great pleasure to be able to join you on this podcast. I thought that uh, it might be a good place for us to begin, of course, in, in your current role uh, at the Supreme Court. Now, the, the Supreme Court was created in 2009 and, of course, replaced the, the House of Lords. And I remember at the time it, it divided opinion somewhat, with some people thinking that we didn't need a Supreme Court, that it would be an expensive and unnecessary waste of time because the House of Lords was functioning so well. Others feared that the move to a Supreme Court would herald a new period of judicial activism and that it would be similar to America's Supreme Court. So looking back at the past decade of, of the court's existence, how would you assess the transformation from the House of Lords to the Supreme Court? As you point out, Steve, we've just celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Supreme Court, so this is perhaps a good moment at which to take stock of the change. Until 2009, the final Court of Appeal in the United Kingdom, that is, the three jurisdictions of England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, was the appellate committee of the House of Lords. The reforms which were introduced by the Constitutional Reform Act were intended to, to achieve a clearer separation of powers. As a result, the Supreme Court was created and it moved across Parliament Square to the refurbished Middlesex Guildhall, which had previously been a Crown Court, a criminal court. We now have a building which is ideally suited to, a, to its purpose. The building also houses a, a second court, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is the final Court of Appeal for some 27 jurisdictions in the Commonwealth, that is overseas territories, dependencies, and some independent states such as Mauritius, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. So the 12 justices of the Supreme Court also sit in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. 
In changing the name to the Supreme Court, the intention was not to create a court such as the US Supreme Court with the power to strike down legislation. In the United Kingdom, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty remains paramount. The powers of the UK Supreme Court are the same as those of the old appellate committee, and we hear exactly the same sort of cases as previously. I don't think that the new court has been any more activist in changing the law than its predecessor. Clearly, there are limits on how far the court should go in this regard. I think all judges would agree with that. More difficult is to define where the line should be drawn. This is the current debate within the United Kingdom over judicial activism. There's a range of views on what are the proper limits of judicial action, and that debate will continue. But I don't believe that the move to a Supreme Court has had any real effect on that. The great advantage of the change, I think, has been that the Supreme Court is now much more accessible to the public than the appellate committee of the House of Lords ever was. The appellate committee used to sit in a committee room in the Palace of Westminster. It was possible for the public to attend, but very few people knew how to set about it. The Supreme Court, by contrast, is open to the public, and large numbers of visitors are able to attend our hearings every day. Uh, in the last year, about 80,000 visitors have attended hearings. In addition, all our hearings are live streamed so that our proceedings are entirely accessible to the public. The judgment of the Supreme Court in Miller No. 2, the prorogation case, was watched live by more than a million people. I was certainly one of those people and uh, I have to say that uh, I enjoyed every minute of, of watching the, the Miller case. I've been uh, loving it being here in Poland and being able to still feel as if I can I can participate in, in the hearings of the, the Supreme Court in, in the UK. Um, it's sometimes said that the UK Supreme Court dines a la carte because it, it decides which appeals to hear on, on which areas of law. Um, I wonder if you could tell us how is that selection made and, and what factors are taken into account when you take that decision? Yes, I think it was Lord Newberger who first made that observation about the Supreme Court preferring to dine a la carte. Uh, the first thing to say here is that we hear many fewer cases each year than most national courts of final appeal. In 2019, we gave judgment in 60 appeals in the Supreme Court and a further 48 appeals in the Privy Council. Uh, usually, but not always, uh, we're able to decide which cases we're going to hear. And we select the cases on two criteria. Are there arguable grounds of appeal? And is there a point of law of general public importance? The decision on whether to grant permission to appeal is taken by a panel of three justices. We nearly always decide these applications on paper, but very occasionally we might hold a short hearing. And we choose the cases which we think are important in themselves and more generally in terms of the development of the law. Now, as a law student, I remember I dreaded every time I received a reading list which had a House of Lords case or cases on that reading list because those cases were generally very lengthy, very complicated, and, and each law lord seemed to give their own separate opinion whether or not they agreed with the majority judgment. And those opinions very often repeated the facts and they repeated the legal history. So it was a very tiring experience uh, mentally and physically to read those, those cases. And now I have to say, I genuinely look forward to Supreme Court judgments and not just the YouTube versions of them, but the written versions too, because they seem in general to be shorter. They seem to avoid separate opinions unless they're absolutely necessary and and they're written in the style almost like the chapter of a textbook in a very accessible manner for the reader so I, i'd like to ask you has there been a conscious effort to change the way or the style in which the court's judgments are, are written well you're right uh, there's been a significant move away from every judge delivering his or her own judgment 
Nowadays, it's much more usual for there to be one leading judgment, whether or not there is a dissenting judgment. Although uh, there are still some cases in which all or most of the justices will produce a separate judgment. Uh, this is due in part to the greater flexibility, the greater procedural flexibility we now enjoy as a result of the move from being the appellate committee of the House of Lords. But it's also due to the view that there's often not a lot of point in five justices all trying to say the same thing. Indeed, that can sometimes lead to uncertainty in the law because it may open up debate as to whether we are actually saying the same thing. There is, however, another school of thought on this subject. Uh, some commentators hold the view that every judge should deliver his or her own judgment, if only to demonstrate that they've really conscientiously applied their minds to the issues in the case. Uh, Dr. F.A. Mann, who was a solicitor and one of the greatest English lawyers in the second half of the 20th century, observed famously that merely to read someone else's essay induces superficiality and intellectual laziness. <laughs> and uh, others, such as Dyson Hayden, now a retired judge of the High Court of Australia, maintain that it's necessary for each judge to produce his or her own reasoned judgment as a guarantee of judicial independence. Uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm not really persuaded by these arguments. Uh, there's no question of intellectual laziness on the part of my colleagues who play a full part in the decision of the case, whether they write a judgment of their own or not. Uh, moreover, I think it's unrealistic, uh, a waste of resources, and a, a bar to accessibility if there are five judgments in every case. But the important thing is that every justice is always free to write his or her own judgment if they wish to do so. Now, there's one question that the British Law Centre students always ask us. So uh, I promised them that I, I would use the occasion of our conversation today uh, to put the same question to you as one of the UK's leading judges. And that, that question is this. If the ratio decidendi of cases is the most important part that the students need to know, they say, why don't English judges simply say in every judgment, here is my ratio decidendi? What would you say in response to that question? Well, I, I entirely understand why students should ask that question. And I understand how frustrating it can sometimes be when it's difficult to work out what a case actually decides. What is the, the ratio of the case? Uh, the answer, I think, is that it's a matter of perspective. That is the angle from which you look at something. The judge deciding a particular case is focused on the facts and the issues in that particular case. The basis on which he decides the case, the ratio decidendi, can be stated in broad or in narrow terms. It may be a very wide principle of general application, or it may be a very narrow decision which turns on the particular facts, or it may be at one of many points in between, in a spectrum. The, the common law is built out of patterns of decided cases. A judge in a later case may well have a better perspective in that he's able to take account of other developments in the law, including those which have taken place after the earlier decision. And when considered in this way, in a wider context, the ratio of the earlier decision can be fitted into the developing pattern of the law in the particular field. In this way, it is possible for earlier decisions to be distinguished. Although the judge in the earlier case may have thought he or she was laying down a general principle, he or she may not have thought of the particular circumstances which arise in the later case and which make it appropriate to limit the basis on which the first case was decided. So as a result, there's a certain flexibility in the concept of the ratio decidendi, which is an important feature of the common law method and which permits the future development of the law. Another issue which always causes great debate in BLC classes is the so-called declaratory theory. In other words, the idea that even the most senior judges don't create new law, but they merely declare what the law always has been. Where do you stand on, on the question 
of whether the precedent creating courts do actually create or reform the law. And if they do, then does this impact in any way on Parliament's lawmaking function? This is a really difficult issue. The declaratory theory, the idea that judges do not make law but merely declare what the law has always been, is a complete fiction. It's a complete fairy story. In reality, of course, judges make law. And in the United Kingdom, at the level of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, this is one of the most rewarding aspects of being a judge, the opportunity to develop the common law. The legal fiction is a necessary one because when the Supreme Court is deciding a case, we're deciding what law is applicable to the particular case, the facts of which have already occurred, and more generally. This is, of course, an important difference between legislation and the common law. In the case of legislation, its effect is usually prospective. It can change the law for the future. In the case of a change in the common law, what is pronounced by the court is taken to have always been the law. Now, the declaratory theory of law does not really impact on the law-making function of Parliament. Uh, in, in our system, Parliament is supreme. The courts cannot disregard an act of Parliament, although they have a considerable power in deciding what an act of Parliament means. And whatever the courts decide can be reversed or overturned by Parliament by passing legislation. But the declaratory theory of law can be very inconvenient and troublesome when the House of Lords or the Supreme Court decides to make a radical departure from previous decisions. Most of the time, the common law develops by small incremental steps, not in giant bounds. When I was a law student, one of my lecturers, Professor Hampson, used to say that the common law moves like a crab and not like a kangaroo. <laughs> but th there are occasions when it's necessary for a senior court to make a major change in the law. Uh, the House of Lords decided in 1966 that it was no longer bound by its own earlier decisions. Nevertheless, it's quite a rare thing for the House of Lords or the Supreme Court to depart from their earlier decisions. And when we're asked to do so, um, we sit as a court of seven or even nine justices. And a recent example is the case of Patel and Mercer on illegality. When the Supreme Court does depart from an earlier decision, it means that not only is the law changed for the future, but it's changed retrospectively. And that can sometimes be very hard on those who have conducted their affairs on the basis of what everyone had assumed the law to be. And that, I suppose, is a disadvantage of the common law which is constantly trying to balance both certainty and flexibility. The Supreme Court's usual home is in London, across the square from Parliament. But in 2017, the court sat in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and then in 2018, it sat in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, before moving to Cardiff in 2019 in Wales. Now, what was the thinking behind the decision to, should we say, move the court around to all four parts of the UK and to hear appeals in the different constituent parts of the UK? We, we usually sit in our building in Parliament Square, right next door to Westminster Abbey and opposite the Houses of Parliament. However, the Supreme Court has recently started sitting in other parts of the United Kingdom. We are the, the final court of appeal for three legal systems, England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And the court has now sat in Edinburgh, in Belfast and in Cardiff, the capital cities of the other parts of the United Kingdom. Although Wales does not have its own legal system, it shares one with England uh, but devolution has meant that there are now important differences between the law applicable in England and that applicable in Wales. The thinking behind the court sitting in the other capital cities within the United Kingdom was to make the Supreme Court more accessible, not just to litigants, but also to the public at large. 
The intention was that the public should be able to attend our hearings more easily, and large numbers of people did indeed do so. The public response to these sittings in the other capital cities outside London has been very enthusiastic. I'm a Welshman, and sitting with the Supreme Court in Cardiff was one of the proudest moments of my professional life. During the week we sat in Cardiff, we managed to hear three substantial appeals, deliver two judgments, including the first Supreme Court judgment in the Welsh language, and make a reference to the Court of Justice of the European Union. And we also had a wonderful time. <laughs> Wales is absolutely wonderful, and Cardiff is an amazing city. Prague is also an amazing city, and as I mentioned at the beginning of, of this podcast, uh, you were due to visit Prague and, and give a lecture at the PLC there, but we had to cancel because of the COVID-19 virus. And that pandemic has caused an enormous amount of plans to, to be put on hold, but the Supreme Court has managed to continue functioning all the way throughout the pandemic. How has it managed to do that? Could I say that I'm very sorry that we had to postpone my visit to Prague to speak to the centre there. Uh, I'm really sorry that that didn't happen, but I hope that it would be possible to rearrange that, and I, I look forward to it very much. So far as our functioning in London is concerned, uh, we sat in court in our building in Parliament Square for the last time on the 18th of March of this year, and, and later that week we moved to online hearings, and since then, all hearings, both of the Supreme Court and of the Privy Council, have been online. We're very fortunate in having the facilities and having outstanding technical staff to make this possible. We had also had some practice because over the last year or so, we've started hearing some Privy Council appeals online, for example, from Mauritius and Trinidad and Tobago, so that lawyers didn't have to travel all the way to London for hearings. However, we never thought that we would be conducting hearings online on the current scale. Uh, we seem to have hardly missed a step. We continued to hear the listed cases, but online with the justices each sitting in their homes and the barristers addressing us from their homes or from their offices. All of the documentation in the appeals was already fully digitalized anyway, so that was a great start. And the judges are able to meet online uh, before the hearing and after the hearing to discuss the outcome of the case. Most of us find that the online hearings are more tiring than actual hearings. And I understand that's quite a common experience. As a result, we take a five minute break mid morning. Uh, apart from that, um, the way in which the hearing is conducted is as similar as it possibly could be to a normal hearing in court. The feedback from barristers appearing before us is that they think the system works well, but they do say that although they can see the judges, they sometimes find it more difficult to work out how the judges are responding to the points they're making. But we're grateful that technology and the skill and dedication of our staff have enabled us to keep the show on the road. Let's hope that the present crisis will soon be resolved and that we will all soon be back to normal working conditions. Absolutely. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to focusing again on, on the future. But if I may, just for a, a short while, I'd like to look at the past and to focus on some aspects of your career before you were appointed to, to the Supreme Court. And you, your time at the Law Commission seems like a, a good place to begin. You were the chairman of the Law Commission between 2012 and 2015, and, and as such, you, you helped to formulate proposals for law reform on a wide variety of legal topics. So could you please tell us, how does the Commission decide which areas of law to consider for reform, and how often are those reforms actually implement it into statutory law. I spent three very happy years as chairman of the Law Commission of England and Wales. It was a wonderful combination of practical law and academic law. I had excellent colleagues and we had a very productive time. 
Uh, the Law Commission was created by Parliament in 1965 to be an independent voice, independent of government, that is, to identify defects, inadequacies, unfairness in our law, and to make recommendations to Parliament for its reform. The Commission has a public consultation every three years in which it invites the public to draw to its attention areas where the law is working unfairly or inadequately. It draws up a shortlist and then it investigates the shortlisted topics. It then discusses with the government and with the Welsh government which projects should be included in its next programme of work. And in addition, the government, the devolved Welsh government, government departments and certain public bodies can ask the Commission to take on a particular project. Now, you're right, a frequent criticism is that the government often fails to implement Law Commission recommendations for law reform. In fact, over the 55 years of its operation, about two-thirds of its recommendations have reached the statute book. That's not a bad rate of success. Uh, in my three years at the Commission, 10 of our reports were implemented by legislation by the Westminster Parliament, and two were implemented by legislation by the Welsh Assembly, which is now the Senev. In uh, recent times, uh, before the Commission takes on a particular project, it asks for an indication from the government or the Welsh government, as the case may be, that it has a serious intention of legislating to remedy that area of the law. Now, that's not a guarantee or a blank check. Governments change, political priorities change, and at the outset, we don't know what the Commission will recommend. Uh, but it can avoid years of work being wasted. And certainly during my time at the Commission, it improved the implementation rate significantly. Within the UK, law reform is usually achieved by legislation, but it can sometimes be achieved by the judges by changing the common law by judicial decision. Uh, and this is what has happened recently in, in relation to the law of illegality in what circumstances can illegal conduct provide a defense to a claim. Uh, this was a particularly difficult issue on which very different issues had been expressed, very different views had been expressed in the leading cases, including the uh, Supreme Court. The Law Commission had worked on this for many years and in the end its recommendations were highly influential in the judicial decision adopted by the Supreme Court in Patel and Mirza. And taking a step even further back uh, into the past, do you remember a reason or reasons behind your decision to study law originally and to become a, a lawyer after that? I grew up in pont in South Wales where my father was a school teacher and I attended the local state school and I particularly enjoyed studying history and English. Going on to university to read law seemed a natural progression. I was lucky enough to win a place at Downing College in Cambridge. Modern history provided a background for constitutional law. Uh, before I started university, I remember I was encouraged to read as much of the UK history of the 19th and 20th centuries as possible. And uh, I also enjoyed English and English literature and, of course, the precise use of language is an important skill which a lawyer has to develop. So I suppose I, I drifted into the law in that way. I've never regretted my choice of a career. Uh, I find it endlessly fascinating and I'm constantly learning new things. And if you hadn't studied law or become a lawyer, then which other profession do you think you would have been most likely to join? Oh, in my wildest dreams, I would have liked to have been a musician, but I always knew that I would never be talented enough to be a success. <laughs> well, you certainly were talented uh, as a lawyer and are as a judge, and you've also studied and worked alongside or against many talented lawyers uh, as, uh, as a lawyer and in your capacity as a judge. Um, so which personal characteristics do you think are the most important in terms of making someone uh, a good lawyer. And when you're listening as a judge, 
to lawyers making submissions in court, then what is it, that certain je ne sais quoi, that makes some lawyers' submissions more compelling or persuasive than others? I would say that integrity is essential for a lawyer. You have to be honest and straightforward, and people, your clients, your colleagues, your opponents, and the judges with whom you appear have to be able to trust you. It helps to have a, a clear analytical mind, but you must be conscientious and hardworking. Uh, it's a great advantage if you enjoy the law. If you're interested in something, you're more likely to succeed at it. Beyond that, I have to say there's a great deal of luck involved. But if you're diligent and hardworking, you can achieve a great deal. And you can make your own luck to a certain extent. As for what makes the best advocates, well, I'd say that the best advocates are those whose submissions have clarity and focus. Of course, you can't improve on the material you have to work with, but within those constraints, try and be as clear as you can and try and focus on the real issues in the case. A good advocate will also try and help the court as much as he or she can, and most judges appreciate that. On the subject of life as a barrister, which elements of practicing as a barrister did you particularly enjoy the most or the least? And now as a judge, what are the most enjoyable aspects of being a judge? Well, the best thing about being at the bar, I always thought, was winning a case for a client, uh, especially if it's a difficult case. And there's no equivalent to that when you're a judge. <laughs> But as a barrister, of course, there's also the very heavy responsibility that you have in conducting a case for a client. The pressures on a judge are different, but they're nevertheless considerable pressures. There's no longer the pressure to win the case, but there is pressure to come to the right and fair conclusion. The most satisfying aspect of being a judge, I would say, at least at the level of the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court, is the ability to change the law, to make a contribution, however small, to the incremental development of the common law. And that I find really thrilling. Perhaps one of the most famous cases with which you were involved as, as a lawyer was the House of Lords appeal in litigation concerning General Pinochet of Chile. Could you please explain why that case has become so famous in English law? and explain your role in that case. The Pinochet case is an important milestone in international law because it established for the first time that while a current head of state enjoys immunity, a former head of state does not enjoy immunity in respect of his actions which constituted official torture contrary to the UN Convention Against Torture. My role in that case was as a micus curiae, that is, an independent advocate to the court, nominated by the Attorney General to give an independent view of the case and to ensure that the court was taken to all relevant authorities. I was instructed in the case at very short notice on the Friday evening before the case started in the House of Lords the following Wednesday. I had to submit my written case on the Monday morning. And I can tell you, I worked harder that weekend than I have ever worked in my life. Because I was a micus curiae and was not representing a party, it was even more difficult than it might have been. I was not speaking on instructions. I had to work out for myself what the answer was. Um, but I have to say that uh, arguing that case was a very thrilling and enjoyable experience. Your first appointment judicial appointment was as a part-time recorder. So you acted as a judge whilst still continuing to practice as a barrister. Now, I know from classes at the BLC that the idea of someone being both a lawyer and a judge at the same time can sound strange to many of our students from continental legal systems in Central and Eastern Europe because they have career judiciaries. So 
In your experience, what are the advantages or perhaps disadvantages of the UK's approach that the judiciary mainly comprises people who used to be practicing lawyers? It's quite usual in the United Kingdom for practicing lawyers to sit as part-time judges. We think it's a valuable system, uh, not least because it gives practitioners the opportunity to learn the skills of sitting as a judge and to see if they might like to do it full-time. Many do and go on to become full-time judges. Judges in the UK are usually appointed from the practicing profession, although sometimes academic lawyers are appointed. This is very different from most of the legal systems in Central and Eastern Europe, where you have a professional judiciary appointed from quite an early age. In the UK, by the time a judge is appointed, he will have many years of experience of practicing or teaching the law. So as a short final question, do you have any particular memories about how it felt when you first started hearing cases as a judge? What I mean is, did you find yourself focusing on how the lawyers were approaching the case and making arguments? Yes. Uh, my first experience of sitting as a judge was sitting in a criminal trial with a jury. And I have to say, it was a very frightening experience for the judge. But I, I think what sitting as a judge does for you uh, in those circumstances when you're sitting part time is that it does improve your advocacy because you see it from a different angle and realize how you might improve your own presentation of cases in court. So it's valuable from that point of view as well. Well, Lord Lloyd Jones, thank you so much. It, it may have been frightening as you remembered when, when you first sat as a judge and I have no doubt that some lawyers who were just about to plead in front of the Supreme Court and in front of you as a judge still have nerves and, and fear inside them. But as, as I suspected, in fact, as, as I knew, um, you managed to take away those nerves from at least one lawyer today and to make me feel very comfortable. So thank you so much uh, for having agreed to do th this interview, for giving us your precious time uh, and for being willing to, to talk to our BLC students. I speak not only for myself, but, but for the whole BLC teaching team and for all of our students across Central and Eastern Europe when I say thank you, thank you, thank you for, for doing this today. And we very much look forward to welcoming you in person to, to one or more of the British law centres throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you, Steve. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. And please could I send my best wishes to all of your students I wish you all every success in your studies and in your careers.